main barrier to more rapid growth is that we have a public debt which is too high. So hear what it means now. This year, this year that this financial year that ending at the end of March next year. No, end of March next month. Month, month. 54% thereabouts of the budget is spent to pay back debt. You take another Twenty odd percent. So we end up twenty five percent. So we are ending up spending eighty percent of the budget, paying salaries and wages, which is the other twenty five, and fifty five paying we, um, debt, paying back for the debt and paying interest on the debt, which means that. What remains for the road, the sports field, the water system, the hospital, the street light, the police car, the equipment for the lab for police, everything else, chalk at school, everything else is coming out of the 20 cents that remain. You know, I know, the little picnic know, that is not enough. And so we have all of this demand for things that you feel correctly needs to be done, and but which is not being done. And it reduces people's trust and belief in government and lack of confidence in the MP, lack of confidence in the councillor, but the heart of the problem that holding it back is that we have this huge debt that is like a millstone on the back of the country. It won't solve the problem for me to tell you where it was, what they call the debt to GDP ratio, which was coming down and when we left office in 2007, it was around 107% of GDP. And when we returned to office, it was 140% of GDP. I don't want to make an issue of that, although there is a time for discussing that. But the heart of this problem is that we have been running up as a country this debt for a long, long time. The average rate of economic growth between 1970 and now has been less than 1% per year on average. And we spend some time discussing when it was more and when it was less and we make a whole heap of political points about it from time to time. And everybody know if you want a political argument, I can be in it too. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to say is that while we have had over that 40 odd years less than 1% growth in economic terms, we have run up the debt more than seven times, 700%. And it reached now, you know, as them say, a weight broker dead stop. It stopped now. We cannot go anymore. No one in the world is willing to lend us resources unless we undertake the necessary reforms. 
So it's like you can have all kind of, it's like you run up a tab. If you run up a bill down at the shop. And you send down every day and you say, you want two pound of rice. You want quarter pound of fish. You want some soap, you want some bread. But you, you never go down there with the money. One day you send down there and nothing will come back. And them say, we can't give you no more credit. That is where we have reached as a country. Last week, Friday, we were able to announce that we have reached an agreement, a staff level agreement with the International Monetary Fund. And that is a good thing. Because if we can secure the agreement of the board of the fund, it will open up access to resources that will enable us to function more effectively. It will open up resources from the institutions like the IDB. It will open up resources from the World Bank, the European Union, and also from private financial institutions so we can continue to function in the world. Whether or not we have an agreement with the IMF is not really, it is something that we have to do. Because the responsibility of any independent country is to manage your affairs so that you can pay your way in the world. Why we need the fund, the International Monetary Fund, is really because the rest of the world looks to them to give you the seal of approval. It's like how you have credit bureau and you go to bank. The bank say, I don't really know you. Them get all the things, but them say, what is your credit score? And them rely on that credit bureau to say, this is a good credit risk or is not a good credit risk. Well, the credit bureau for the world is the IMF. They are like a banker now, sometimes they say, well, do things, we would have done it differently. But in the end, the choice that we have is not so much whether we agree with every element of the program or not. The commitment that we have to make is to put our affairs in order so we never, ever have to have any outside element determine what we need to do. And I have said it publicly. I don't wish on anyone ever to have to undergo the kind of encounter and stress, could use other words, but let me use that one, that has been involved in these negotiations. And I know from the 
most honorable prime minister and the cabinet that we are determined to manage this because it is our legacy contribution in commemoration of our 50 years of independence that no generation for the future is going to have to undergo this experience of having to have others prescribe the policy paths that we must follow. We need to do it ourselves because that is what sovereignty and independence means. And everybody know, if you don't manage your own affairs properly, people will come and manage it for you. In every sphere of life. If you have your yard and you can't live in peace in your yard, police come inside and tell you how to live. Or take out who can live good. That's just the lesson of life. So, last week also had some other events in it. But I want to say most of all that our economic program has at its center the reduction of the debt to get to a debt to GDP ratio of 95% by 2020. That is the program. That's what we have programmed. By all the measures of the world economies, the appropriate level for countries should be around 60%. So even at the end of that process, we're still going to be in the realm of difficulty. But there is one way we can overperform and reduce it even quicker, which is to achieve the second main objective of the program, or the main objective really, which is to get economic growth and job creation underway. Because the more we get the growth moving, is the quicker the debt to GDP ratio will come down. So like any family, what we are determined to do is to undertake the reforms as quickly as, and effectively as possible. It involves difficulty and sacrifice. But I don't know a parent, any good parent, that is not prepared to sacrifice for the future of their family, for their children. Just like the generation of Manley and Nether Soul and Edith Dalton James undertook the challenge of sacrificing to achieve independence and the vote for the Jamaican nation, we have to undertake this to achieve economic independence and lay the foundations for development for Jamaica and the future generations. What are the elements of what we have to do? First of all, it means that we're going to have to spend within our means. And it also means that we are going to have to raise revenues adequate to deal with achieving what they call the primary surplus target, which is to have revenues above what we are spending for debt service to undertake so that we can pay down the debt and undertake the development that needs to be undertaken. There is a commitment that the cabinet made at its special meeting, 
which is not only that we will raise the revenues, but that we will place education after debt. Education is going to be the main claim on the budget because we believe our best resource in this country are the children of this country because they are the future and every child deserves an education. Education, children, security. While undertaking all the things we need to do to secure economic growth. I will say today that I have been overwhelmed by the kind of patriotic commitment which I see throughout Jamaica in relation to this particular program. Today, the National Debt Exchange offer was to have been received. The Ministry of Finance, the Debt Management Unit hasn't finished tallying it all, but I can say that we are approaching a 100% take up by the bondholders of the country. And contrary to a report that was in the press, the discussions between the public sector unions and the government have been going well. And I want to applaud the patriotic commitment of the workers in the public sector and the trade unions as a whole. In order to secure the agreement with the International Monetary Fund Board, we have agreement with the staff. The board has said there are some prior actions that we must undertake. One of them was the, to put a cap on waivers and then introduce a new waiver, a new system in relation to tax collection. Because we definitely have to arrange our affairs that the burden of taxation is carried more equitably in the country. We cannot have the people who have less pay more and elements that have more pay less. We have to have a level playing field and we have to collect what is due so we can provide the services for the country. We have already announced in the parliament the arrangements. The national debt exchange was one of the other prior actions and when the tally is finished We'll make a statement, but I believe that we have met the bar and the target in that regard. But I say something. If there are any elements that don't come in, it cannot be that we are going to allow those who have made the sacrifice to give up their returns and allow those who have not come in to benefit as if, and then penalize those who have demonstrated their patriotism. Who have ears to hear, let them hear. You're not going to stand one side while the others sacrifice. And then Go and put your returns in your pocket while others have sacrifices. It's just not part of the program. It's not fair, and we have to share the sacrifice involved at this point. So what remains? We have also done the revenue raising measures. And I hear a lot of talk 
first point I want to make about to those who talk about suddenness is that those measures are all for implementation in the main in at April 1st. So to tell somebody that you're going to do something with effect from April. That is not how Nicodemus operated. I don't mind the comment, but you must have honest, accurate, sincere commentary. But it is necessary that we secure additional revenue flows. The second point I would make is that we sought the cabinet under the insistence and direction of the prime minister, labored long and hard to find a way to raise the revenue, but in a way that would have the least impact on the poorest segments of the population and the most vulnerable elements of the population. You couldn't exclude everyone from impact, but there were things like basic foods and those things that were off the table as far as the cabinet led by the most honorable Portia Simpson Miller is concerned. And that leads me now to the question of the National Housing Trust. First concern was to ensure that if we could get a distribution from the Housing Trust to make sure that it would not cut down the availability of housing units that the trust builds every year for people who are in need of housing. Days were spent with independent consultants to go and look at the balance sheet of the housing trust to ensure that it could be done. And we are satisfied that there will be no less building or mortgages available using the average of what the trust has done over the previous three years. So we say, make certain that it can continue to operate as it has operated. And if it even had a problem, it has assets like mortgage assets that you can monetize. I don't want to get too complex, but Simply put, we satisfied ourselves that the trust would be able to continue to operate as it has because it was an administration led by Michael Manley that established the National Housing Trust and we would never do anything on this side to impair that institution. The second thing though, the decision was taken to secure the $11 billion from the trust because if it was not that, it would have to have come from some other source of taxation. And the pressure of that would be on the most vulnerable people in the society so they can still get the house and we can get the 11 billion dollars and those who those who are trying to put a spanner in the works in that regard are not doing the poor any service in that regard let me say so definitively what would have to happen to look at including rice and flour and those things in the GCT or something else. 
So, and if there, but I'll make one other point. If the intention is to try to destroy the program through litigation and to prevent us getting an agreement necessary for the forward movement of our economy, then the cabinet is prepared to undertake the legislative amendments if that is the only way they leave open to us. But we are not going to have this program derailed by people who are either misguided or worse. Not going to do it. There's too much at stake. Too much at stake for the future of the country. I want to make just one Two. Two sets of concluding comments. First of all, especially in the light of the failure of the agreement with the fund entered into in 2010, to be completed. And in view of the fact that we have had to go to another debt exchange within three years, which is not good, not good for confidence, builds up the trust deficit. Everybody asked the question. Prime Minister and myself met with pensioners, we met with bondholders, locally and internationally, the question arises, what is going to be different now? What is going to make Jamaica do it now when it wasn't done before? It's a legitimate question. First of all, as I said, only the Almighty can give absolute guarantees about the future. But I believe that the first requirement of us doing it is to be absolutely honest and transparent with the people of the country about what the situation is. There is no possibility of allowing ourselves to fail at this. As them said, dog, nyam, we supper for now and for decades into the future. The cabinet has instructed that we should set up a special unit in the Ministry of Finance that has no other purpose than to ensure that all the ministries, departments, and agencies do what is necessary to make the program go forward. That is one thing. The second thing is that we have agreed in the principle of transparency, openness, shared sacrifice, and nation building that we will establish with the stakeholders, such as the who are making a being asked to make a tremendous sacrifice. The creditors, the productive sector, that we that we will establish an oversight committee and we will share all the information with that oversight committee, except for those things that you call market sensitive, that a man can use to perhaps advantage himself or disadvantage the country. But we'll share everything. And they are free to talk. Because I don't even want to see it as, a, as something that we are giving up because if we are going to succeed at this as a country, we have to succeed together. 
one for all and all for one. Operating in that manner, we shall not fail. The third thing is that the program has the heavy lifting at the front. That's why it is either as prior action or of things to be done, legislation to be passed in the first year. Because the lesson of the failure of the previous program, not that we would be in danger of repeating it, but the le one lesson is that the future of the country was sacrificed for political advantage. As elections approached, the program was abandoned. And so we, we are doing what needs to be done right up front. Now, so that's one of the two things that I had to say. But on the positive side, more positive side, we believe that the country has tremendous prospects for growth and that the adjustments will unlock growth if we can make the partnerships work. Partnerships with big business, with small business, with micro enterprise. Partnerships with communities. Partnerships with CBOs. The sectors that give obvious prospect, agriculture. You know, some things have happened and more things can happen. But we import in this country close to a billion US dollars worth of foodstuffs every year. It is not good for your national food security and we can grow more of what we eat and eat more of what we grow. And remember now, part of what we import includes things like corn for the broiler industry. But I am pleased that already we are seeing the signs of the replacement of the overseas supplies, some of which is subsidized by local production. I believe there's 300 acres of corn that has gone into the ground by one of the companies and it, the prospect of extending it further. We are replacing the imported malt that goes into beer making with, with malt produced by cassava, which is a good development. We want to make those things work and the government has implemented a series of agro-parks that are intent on being the fulcrum, the center of the partnership with the producers in relation to the agricultural sector. We're going to put more people to work. And coming in here, driving from Kingston, I notice a stepping up of some of the agricultural activity as the people clearing fields for planting, chop down some tree. Fields that used to be in production now return into production, and we want to see more and more of that because that is the ultimate objective, to put people to work on big farms, on medium-sized farms, and on liquor plots. The other area that we think has tremendous potential is in ICT, Information Communication Technologies. Already since March of last year, the Development Bank of Jamaica has lent 20 million US dollars, and we are going to do another 20 million that is going to produce more than 10,000 jobs for people in this area of information and communication technologies. And there is 
no limit to what is possible in that sector. Everybody has heard about the expansion of the Panama Canal and the requirements that will flow from it to have some key logistic centers because it's going to mean bigger and bigger ships that they were going to have to use places to send the big bulk cargo on to other places. Jamaica intends to become a global hub in that regard because it can put people to work and it will take advantage of one blessing that the Almighty gave us, which is geographic location. We stand midway between Europe and Asia. We write one night sail from the Panama Canal and we are midway between North America and South America. We intend to expand our port and we intend to set up the logistics hub and to get more Jamaicans working by implementing that series of projects to make Jamaica one of the global hubs in world trade. In energy, we're not only going to reduce the cost of energy, but we are going to find new energy sources, renewable supplies, not only to put people to work, but to unlock the possibilities for manufacturing which continues to be an important area of potential development. Tourism development. Already there are more than 2,000 additional rooms at various stages of construction. And we intend to pursue, but not only just to have hotel rooms and people come and eat foreign food, but as we restructure the incentive regime we're going to apply incentives to the greater utilization of local inputs. Local human resources. Local foods and drink. Local furniture for those who want to benefit from incentives in this sector and in other sectors. You have heard the announcements on the pilot project in terms of rare earth elements. For years we have been just putting the red mud in reservoirs. But thank God that science has advanced sufficiently that there are new opportunities in this area and we are going to seize those opportunities for the people of Jamaica. So, with the adjustments that we have to make, I don't want people to have a sense of holding them head and like beliefs uh, end of the world has come. We must take courage, have faith in ourselves, have confidence in our ability to work with each other and strike out boldly for the future in the same way that our forefathers and mothers, from Daddy Sharp through to Buster Mountain, Norman Manley, and the generations before. Now, under the leadership of our Prime Minister, we are striking out in confidence and certainty that we are building the new Jamaica that was envisioned by those who went before. 